James chapter 3. Let's ask the Lord to be here. Jesus, we, uh, we again are, are coming to you um, with our hearts open and our Bibles open. Uh, Lord, we, we just want to hear from you. We want, we want your word to be something that actually makes a difference in our life, actually impacts us. And, and uh, Lord, I, I just pray for the teaching of the word that it would be something that um, is just glorifying to you and a blessing to your people. And uh, Lord, that you would just um, increase here and that we would decrease. Um, we love you, Lord. Um, thank you for what your word has to say, especially in the book of James. It's pretty straightforward. Um, he's a pretty straight shooter. And uh, Lord, we uh, again ask that you give us ears to hear uh, what your spirit has to say to the church. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, James chapter 3 is all about the tongue. And uh, basically, the, the theme of James has been faith. And so we've talked about faith in a, in a num number of different instances and in this case um, I, I just I kind of title chapters and when I got to James chapter 3 it's uh, faith and control and specifically um, in control of the tongue in fact that's a title that's in my Bible here faith controls the tongue and that's a good thing to, to be controlling um, you know one of the actually uh, sins with the tongue uh, seem to me to be the only sins that Christians just kind of overlook. It's just, a, it's just amazing to me that Christians can be so on top of it in all kinds of areas. And so we talk about sexual sin and we talk about, you know, just um, uh, sin in the, in the area of what I, what I think of business, as uh, business relationships, honesty and, and uh, that kind of stuff. But sins of the tongue don't, just don't seem to get um, dealt with a lot in the Christian world. And I'm not talking obviously about it in our church necessarily, but I'm just talking about with Christians in general. The worst things that have ever happened to me in my life have happened to me from Christians and their tongues. Worst things that have ever happened to me in my life. And I've had some pretty, pretty bad things happen to me. I'd rather get punched in the face than gossiped about behind my back. But you know, would you agree with that? I don't know if you'd agree with that, but I would. Just punch me, okay? And instead of yakking behind your back. And this is one of those passages where James goes through and he talks about the whole issue of the tongue in the context of teachers and then in the, in the context of uh, Christians in general and just hammers home uh, the uh, concept of keeping your mouth shut, <laughs> you know, or blessing people with your tongue instead of cursing them. And uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, rule to keep. Let's go through and read it. Um, I'm going to just go through and read the whole chapter, and then we'll come back and hit on it. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able to also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring sudden forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so the whole section 
there on the tongue. One of the things that, that's kind of cool about this passage, though, is this is probably the first book that's written in the New Testament. And does this church, do, do the people that he's writing to have a problem with their tongues? Yeah. That's, that's encouraging. <laughs> Because nothing's changed very much over the last 2,000 years. You have, you have a group of people who are saying that they're followers of Christ. And obviously James is talking about issues that are going on in their lives and speaking to the fact that they, you know, again, need to keep their mouths shut, need to stop the gossip, need to stop all the junk that, that, uh, that goes around and, and make sure that they honor God with every part of their body and especially with their tongue. And um, I like the way that he starts out because what he starts out with is with teachers. Um, uh, he says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And the reason that he says that obviously is because teachers were more responsible. You know, when um, I, I always talk about when I first got saved, I knew nothing about the Bible. That's not the case anymore. Now I know all kinds of stuff about the Bible. I read my Bible every day. And I've been reading my Bible uh, every day pretty much for 40 years. So just think about how, how much time I've spent in the Word of God over the last 40 years. And I know things about the Bible. I, I, not only, I not only just go through and read it, I have to study it. And so I have whole books um, in the Bible. I, I know where everything is in whole books of the Bible because I've outlined them and I've taught them over and over again. Guess what that makes me? Accountable. I, I know what the word of God has to say. I know how things are supposed to be going. I know uh, what my life is supposed to look like. And I'm accountable to God for those things. That's why he says there, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. We are accountable for the things that we know, which is not a reason not to read your Bible <laughs> because you know that you're supposed to. <laughs> right? But we are accountable for the things that we know. And so the more that I know about who God is and what his word has to say and what my life's supposed to look like and how I'm supposed to treat you and how I'm supposed to respond when you treat me certain ways and, and uh, that kind of thing, when I don't do it, I, I'm going to be standing before God on those things. Isn't that a little scary? Yeah, that's a little scary. And a lot of times uh, um, what happens um, when somebody gets saved is, uh, that a lot of times they think that um, they want to be used of God, and so immediately they feel like God's called them to be a pastor. Uh, God's called them to be a teacher or a preacher, and that's where they want to be. They want to be up front and stuff, and they're not recognizing the responsibility that goes along with the thing. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, again, you know, I, I don't do this stuff perfectly, but I try to live my life um, where I'm living it before Jesus in private, not just in public, but in private. And there are, there are times when I've said things or done things that I know about that I know need to, need to be taken care of. And I can't sleep at night if I don't do it because I take this stuff seriously. And it's not just this. It's just the fact that when, when Jesus came into my life, he took and purified me. And he made me something different than I was before. When, you know, before I was a Christian, I was just like anybody else. And what I wanted to do was just win all the time, win arguments all the time. And now I'm not really, you know, you know, all that interested in being right. I'm just interested in being right with the Lord, being, um, being right with the people who are around me. And this is what I mean by that. It doesn't mean that I, that I back down on things because there are places that I will not go. And I don't care how hard somebody pushes me and I don't care what they say about me. I don't care. There's a, there, there are times when you will come up against me and I'm just not moving and I'm not going to move. And so I'm not talking about trying to get along with people in the sense of uh, I, just, I just want everything to be nice uh, between me and other people. Me and my, uh, my, me and my wife were talking about this on the uh, way to church here uh, this morning and we were talking about my son and he is working in the workplace and he's, got, he's working with non-believers and they're talking to him about things that he doesn't want to hear. And so there are kids in his Dairy Queen that are talking to him about sexual exploits with other girls and uh, with girl, girls that they're dating and, and that kind of stuff. And finally, he just um, basically turned around to a guy and started yelling at him, told him to shut up. He doesn't want to hear it and that kind of stuff. And uh, Bobby asked him, so, you know, how do these people respond to you? <laughs> do, you know, do they like you afterwards? And he goes, I don't care if they like me or not. And I go, whose child is this? And she goes, he's yours. You know, and that's exactly what I'm like. I get to a point and I'm just like, shut up. 
And I don't care what you think about me. I don't care. I, I don't care. There are places that I'm not going to go. You know, we, we, are to, we are to have standards as believers, and there are places that we don't, you know, there's hills that you don't move off of. There's hills that are worth fighting for, and you don't give them up, right? And so there's that. Um, but with that, you can, you can still be kind to people, and you can be truthful with people, and you can treat people in a, in a way that's glorifying to the Lord um, without compromising anything. And I don't even think that there's a balance there. There's just, it just is what it is. There are things that we don't compromise on. It doesn't matter who it is. And if people try to make, make me make a choice between Jesus and, and, and them, then they're always going to lose. And that's, that's just set in my mindset. But then on the other hand, there's ways to reach people. And so there are some people who are caught up in their sin and they need to be encouraged and they need to be reasoned with and, and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, if that doesn't work, then you just give them over to the Lord uh, in a situation like that. But we are accountable before God. And that's what I'm talking about. We're accountable before God to do the things that he's, that he's called us to, to make sure that we live a life that's glorifying to him and to make sure that we do not move. We do not move. When we know something's right, it's just right. And so you make sure that you do it right. He goes on and he says, verse 2, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. That is one of the problems with being a teacher, too. It goes right along with, with uh, the whole thing with the stricter, stricter judgment. Um, part of the problem with teaching is that you're moving your mouth all the time. And so I move my mouth all the time, and stuff comes out. And a lot of times the stuff that comes out is good stuff, but sometimes the stuff that comes out is bad stuff. And I hate it when the bad stuff comes out. There, there are times when I'll teach something or I'll say something and I'll get my facts wrong. It always makes me crazy when I get my facts wrong because what happens is, I, you know, I used to have home Bible studies, and this is when it would really get to me. I'd have a home Bible study, and we'd have like 50 people come into my home Bible study and stuff. And so I'd teach something, it, it was on a Monday, uh, that somebody touched me. No, that's a song. <laughs> sorry. Um, you guys don't even know that song, do you? Oh, okay, sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't even work with you. In any case, it, um, it was a Bible study that was on a Monday, and pretty much everybody was kind of a unit. But if I taught something that was off the wall, not radically, but, you know, it was the information was wrong. And I figured it out. Um, I'd come back to, you know, come back the next Monday and I'd talk to everybody. I'd say, okay, that stuff that I just said last week, let me go through and fix that whole thing up because that was wrong. Here's the right thing. Was everybody there that was there the week before? Yeah, never, never. And there would be people that would be gone and, you know, they, they, might, they might be out working or, or doing whatever. They'd be gone for two or three weeks and they'd go around and they'd share the things that I shared at the Bible study. Invariably, all the junk that I taught would get spread around to other people and it was just so irritating. I try to be real careful when I share things. Uh, did, how many of you guys came, came this morning, right? The stuff with the dolphin, I said the... the, the nose through the brain. It's not the brain, it's the melon. There's, a, there's an echolocator on the front of their head. And so I'm sitting there teaching it, and I'm like, is that right? You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, ah, just go for it. I'm pretty sure that's right. You know, I went and spread that whole thing. And I, you know, then I'm thinking about it afterwards. I'm sitting at lunch thinking about it. I'm like, I don't think that was right. And so I Google it. And so I go to, I go to dolphins to, to look at you know, where their uh, blowhole is. What, what it was was I was, I was talking about evolution and the fact that the blowhole, uh, dolphins were supposed to come from a cow-like animal and the cow's nose is on the front of his face and their nose migrated upwards over the top of their head. And I was like, there's a brain up there. You know, how's it going to go through there? It's not the brain. There's an there's a organ on the front of their face that's called the melon, and it's used in echolocation. And that's the organ that um, you have the, that's in the way, besides some other, some other points. You know, it's like your nose starts traveling up between your eyes and gets to the top of your forehead, basically, is what happened in the case of dolphins. So anyway, I said brain, and so now it's out there. And it's like, oh, no, how am I going to fix that? And so I get on Facebook and use it for what it should be used for, apologizing. <laughs> so I got on Facebook real quick and did a mea culpa and 
and all that stuff. And again, it's because, you know, we talk so much. You're a teacher, you talk so much that there are gonna be things that come out of your mouth that just cause people problems. I will tell jokes. I've told jokes before and people have taken me seriously when I'm joking around. I've, um, I've, been, I, I've uh, left out a, you know, I might, I might leave out some concept um, when, I'm, when I'm teaching something. Obviously, every time I'm teaching the Bible, I can't use the whole Bible every single time and give every nuance on everything. And so I'll leave out some concept and somebody will take off and think that, you know, certain things are going on. I was talking one time, I'll just give you an example. This is a little bit extreme, but I was talking about the fact that, um, you know, pastors need to be pure and they need to have godly lives and um, they need to be sexually pure and, and that kind of stuff. That, you know, I think that we were going through First Timothy or something, just talking about being faithful to your wife. And a lady in our fellowship comes walking up to my wife and she goes, God bless you. And Bobby's like, why? She goes, you are so strong. And Bobby's like, what are you talking about? That, that you and your husband remain pure? How long have you been married? <laughs> And she, and Bobby's going, what? What are you saying? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it was before we had kids too, yeah. But you, you remained pure for so long. And Bobby's like, what? What are you talking about? Turns out she thought purity meant having no sex and that kind of stuff. And Bobby had to talk to her about, you know, that whole thing, which is always fun. <laughs> But, but, you know, I can be sitting here making comments uh, about stuff, and it's just amazing the stuff that people get out of it. I've had people come up to me, you know, usually when I, when I talk to you about uh, things that people say to me uh, about my Bible studies, they're, they're coming up and encouraging me in the, in the sense of th saying things like, God used you in this whole situation. There have been a lot of times when people have come up to me and said that God used me so radically in the last Bible study because he said this to them and he said that to them and he said this to them and none of it was in my Bible study. I didn't say a word of it. And so they took off on some phrase that I used, you know, some concept that I just barely touched on and they took off and they thought I was teaching on something completely different. Either that or they're just reading their Bible and God's speaking to them, that's cool. But if they're taking it from my Bible study, I didn't say that. <laughs> You know, any, anything that I was talking about had nothing to do with it. And so, again, the, the whole issue of, of opening your mouth and saying things and, and being involved in people's lives, God takes this whole thing seriously. And if you're ever in the position to be teaching somebody, you need to take it seriously too. And so, um, in the first place, he says, let not many of you become teachers. And that's the idea of if you're going to teach, then it needs to be a definite calling from God. And you just don't take it, you know, you don't, you don't treat it cavalierly. You don't just decide, yeah, you know, I could teach. I could do what that guy does. Actually, I did that when I, when I was a young believer. I was like, I watch, I watch Greg Laurie. And I go, yeah, I could do that. I could, I could, I could do that stuff. And I started thinking in those terms. And so God gave me a couple opportunities and they were in the context of witnessing. So guys would come up to me and they'd start talking to me about um, Jesus and church and, and the Bible and ask me questions and stuff. And I would start answering them and they would, you know, they would ask me a question. They, then, they'd go, then they'd say this to me, well, where's that in the Bible? I'd give them an answer. they go, where's that in the Bible? And I couldn't tell them because all I did was repeat what, what my pastor had told me. So I'm at church last, last Sunday, and he said this, and so I just repeated it to the guy that I'm talking to. He goes, where's that in the Bible? I go, I'm like, I have no idea. And he, you know, the guy would look at me and go, you don't know what you're talking about, do you? And I started realizing that I can't do what he does because I don't know where this stuff is even at. And it made me study more, which is a good thing. In any case, um, we need to be taking it seriously, and part of the reason that we take it, need to take it seriously is because we can stumble people. We could say things that um, have an effect on them that is, is detrimental if we're not watching out um, you know, what, we're, what we're talking about. And so uh, be careful about that whole thing. He goes on, well, you know what? Let me, let me do some verses with you. These are some verses out of Proverbs and, and uh, they're particularly for teachers. And they, they just talk about the kind of influence that your tongue can have when you're doing it right. Here's one, the preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And so if you're ever gonna be in, in any kind of teaching ministry, one of the things that 
you want to be doing is obviously studying. Preparations of the heart belong to man. And so I study. I study my Bible. I study, I study the text that we're going through. Um, I, I try to make sure that I've got everything squared away. But I recognize that when I'm standing up in front of you, that there may be different directions that God's going to take me. That there may be different directions that God's going to go. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And so there are times when I'm talking to you and none of it's in my notes. And it's just because God's doing the leading in that whole thing. It's not my, my great um, studying ability that's going to get a, a across the word of God in a way that's going to make people um, really change their lives. Here's some more. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. And then there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. And so when, you're, when you are um, speaking into somebody's life in the area of teaching, and it's not just an upfront thing, because we all teach, don't we? If you're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about the Bible, and you start informing them about the things that are in the Bible, what are you doing? Yeah, you're teaching. And so when you're, when you're doing this stuff, then what you need to be doing is making sure that you're bringing forth wisdom and not just spouting things. Um, had some uh, situations, you know, I've, I've had some situations in my life that, that were kind of like, um, they, to me, they were like two by fours, you know, upside the head uh, from God and not necessarily even with me, but uh, I would watch people. And there's this one time where I knew a kid uh, who just given his life to the Lord. He was about two weeks old in the Lord. And uh, one of the guys that was his counselor, we, you know, we have new convert counselors and they'll come up and talk to people afterwards. One of the guys who's, who was his counselors uh, um, had spoken to him after the event where he got saved. Well, two weeks later, this guy, this guy, the counselor is an usher with me and we're sitting in the foyer at our church. And this new believer comes walking up and he goes, dude, we were in California, dude, the stuff that you told me on the day that I got saved, that wasn't right. I just read thus and such in the Bible. And he starts quoting a Bible verse. And this guy is sitting there and he's all embarrassed, totally embarrassed because the, the, the guy schooled him on, on this stuff. And basically what had happened to him was he's standing in front of a new believer and the new believer asks him a question and he doesn't know the answer. So he made one up. He just made something up. And then two weeks later, this guy's reading through his Bible and God shows him that the answer was wrong. You don't do that. You don't make things up. Uh, you know, one of the things, again, that we need to keep in mind is that um, this is not, you know, the, the stuff that we're doing here as Christians is not about making us look good. It's about sharing the truth and being wise about the whole thing. So I want wisdom to come out. Here's another, the, the other one, Proverbs 12, 18. There's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. You know, there are times when the things that you say to people need to pierce like a sword. There's a, there's a passage in Acts chapter 2 where Peter is talking to uh, the Jews in Jerusalem right after the Holy Spirit's given. And at the end of the sermon, it says their hearts were cut to the quick. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, right? Right? And the reason that their hearts were cut was because they were guilty and the things that Peter was saying were, were going straight to the heart. There, there, there's, a, there's a time for that, but the purpose of that is healing. It's not to destroy somebody, it's to heal them, right? And so there are times when you can say hard things to people and hopefully you love them before you start saying the hard things to them but you can say hard things to people, but it, in, instead of being like a, like a sword, you come up and whack somebody with a broadsword, you know what a broadsword is, you know, like this long, six feet long, and whoa, two-handed. Sometimes you need to be using the word of God as a scalpel. And scalpels are designed to, they cut, but they're designed to heal. That's the point behind them. And so you need to, again, watch your words when you do that. Um, what we're trying to do as teachers, um, whether you're an official teacher in the, in the sense of you have that gift or whether, you're, whether or not you're teaching friends about what the Bible has to say, what the point of being a teacher is, is reaching somebody for Jesus, trying to reach them. And so you need to figure out what people need to hear to reach them. 
and to impart the wisdom that the Bible talks about. The truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And that's something that um, is actually pretty encouraging because if you're somebody who's truthful and you practice telling the truth all the time, and especially in the context of sharing the word of God with people, you can know that you're, that you're going to be established forever. But if you're a liar, that's but for a moment because it's all coming out. You know, Jesus talked about the, the fact that um, everything that was, that's been whispered in secret Every, everything that's been done in the secret places is going to be shouted from the rooftops. It's good to live your life that way, recognizing that all the little secrets that you have are not going to be secret. You know, and obviously we need to be repenting of sin and things like that. And when you've repented of a sin, God's not shouting that from the rooftop. But if you've repented from a sin, then you're not going to be trying to hide it anymore, are you? You're just going to turn away from it and you're going to live your life for Jesus. Um, but again, we need to uh, be people who are um, truthful and walking with the Lord. Tongues destructive in its influence. Um, verses, uh, in the next couple of verses there. Oh, actually, you know what? I don't want to do that yet because I want to talk about this whole, whole horse and bridle thing. He says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths uh, that they may obey us. We turn their whole body. Look at the, also at ships. Uh, they are so large and are driven by fierce winds. They're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See uh, how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and set, uh, sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every beast of, and bird of reptile and creature of the sea uh, is tamed and has been tamed by, by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And that's a, that's a great description of uh, a lot of people's tongues, an unruly evil full of deadly poison, and they just take it and they spread it around. And it's not supposed to be so with us. That's what people do in the world. That is not what people are supposed to be doing in the body of Christ. And if people are doing it in the body of Christ, it's an indication that there's a major cancer in their lives. It's not, again, supposed to be happening. You know, I've got horses. And one of the things that's just amazing to me, horses are, my horses are like 1,200 pounds. And so they outweigh me by, you know, four or five times. And um, you put a bit in their mouth, and they just go wherever you want them to. And even if they're all rowdy and stuff, they still go wherever you want them to. Um, because that part of their mouth is tender and that part of their mouth is something that they don't want to be yanked on basically and uh, James in this passage talks about the fact that the tongue is something that area of your mouth you're, well basically it's just talking about your mouth your mouth is something that um, gets pulled around by your tongue and your tongue is set on fire by hell and so it's one of those places that you really have to watch out for because Satan will just lead you around by it. That's, that's the point that's being made there. We need, we need to be able to be in control of what comes out of our mouth. The problem is that we don't have any control of what comes out of our mouth because like he says, verse eight, no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Jesus talked about this. He, 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 he talked about the way that your language changes, the way that what comes out of your mouth changes, and it, and it is never by trying to tame the tongue. The way that your language changes, the way that what comes out of your mouth changes, is by changing your heart. This is one of the thing, those things that I learned again when I was a young Christian. I had a real hard time with the whole cussing thing, and I was, uh, uh, I was again, one of those guys that... Um, you know, when I was on the practice field and that kind of stuff, um, I didn't cuss more than the other guys, but I did. And the F word was something that was used routinely, the F bomb and, and all of that stuff. And I become a Christian and that's not appropriate anymore. Even I had that figured out, that it's not appropriate to have that kind of junk coming out of your mouth. I was, you know, I'd, I'd been a Christian for a day and I knew better than to, than to be spouting off a bunch of trash out of my mouth. The problem was how to stop it. 
And so I tried all kinds of stuff. And basically, um, I've got a personality where I get frustrated. If, if things are not going the way that I want to go, and especially on a practice field, if they're not going the, the way that I want to go, I just get frustrated and I, and I lose it. Not lose it totally, but just like, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. I used to pole vault, of all things. Most frustrating sport ever. Because you're going down and there's all the stuff you gotta, you gotta get squared away when you hit a box and if you don't hit it right and if you don't you know, swing your legs up right, you can, you can run into standards and you can fall and all kinds of bad things. And poles can break and, and things like that. I, I can't tell you how many times I picked up my pole and just chucked it as far as I could with, you know, with some kind of curse word coming out of my mouth because I was so frustrated about stuff. And that's where I was when I first became a Christian. It was that kind of stuff going on. And I would recognize that I blew it, and I'd just be going, God, I'm sorry. You know, and it seemed like I was apologizing all the time for the stuff that was coming out of my mouth, and I was trying to control my tongue. And usually I do, I do well on Monday, and then I you know, get a little frustrated on Tuesday. By Wednesday, I've lost it, and I'm dragging myself back into church on Sunday, get encouraged, come back out on, uh, come back out on Monday, and we'd start the cycle again. And what finally happened was I was going through the Gospels and I was reading and Jesus said that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And when I read that, I was like, oh, the problem is not my tongue. The problem is my heart. I got that one. I, you know, I got that figured out. I was smart enough to, to jump in on that. So the problem is my heart. And all this time I've been trying to tame my tongue. And I did everything. You know, I did, I, I did stuff like I tried counting to 10. You know, counting to 10 does not work. I literally tried biting my tongue. My grandma would say, bite your tongue. And I'd be like, you know, this one time I was just like, maybe that's it. <laughs> you know, so I just <laughs> chomp down on my tongue when, when you know, and, and it worked for a couple of seconds. And, but then, you know, then you just lose it again. And when I realized that, what was happening was that there was junk in my heart and it didn't matter if I could control my tongue and keep it from coming out. It was still in my heart. It was in my head. And so if I'm cussing in my head and I'm all ticked off in my head, then sooner or later that's coming out my mouth. And that's what happens with people. And so when people have a problem with their tongue, it's not actually a problem with the tongue. It's a problem with their heart. Their heart isn't right. You've got junk coming out of your mouth. It's because your heart's not right. And it doesn't matter what the junk is. So the junk can be cussing. The, the junk can be gossip. The junk can be a negative attitude. The junk can be, you know, it can be all kinds of stuff. But it's all junk. And so what's got to happen is your heart has to be cleansed. So how do you cleanse your heart? And, you know, the Bible talks about the word of God. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. And so that's one of the ways that you can do it. Here's, here's, a, here's another thing. You know, who you hang out with is who you become like. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but you start talking like the people that you hang out with. You have the same language, the same, the same concepts, the same attitudes, all of that kind of stuff. It's scary when my wife acts like me. I start, you know, <laughs> we hang out all the time. And it's the same thing with my friends. I've got friends that I hang out with all the time, and we can finish each other's sentences that kind of thing. So who are you hanging out with? And if you're hanging out with people who have bad attitudes and maybe not even believers, the Bible says that bad companions corrupt good morals. And that's an issue. And so you have to be checking that out. What are you listening to all day long? You know, what, what, what do you have on Pandora? What's your little radio, Pandora radio station? What are you listening to? What do you have on, on uh, what is that, on iTunes and all that kind of stuff. You have that kind of stuff pumped into your head that is ungodly and frankly uncivilized many times, just trashy junk going through your head constantly. Guess what's coming out of your heart? That's garbage in, garbage out. That's the way that it goes. And so those are things that you have to be looking at and that's stuff that I looked at at the time. This was back in the 70s, you guys. And back in the 70s, you know, all the 70s songs, it's all, the songs are elevator music now. You listen to them, and it's all elevator music. But that's the stuff that was causing me to stumble back then because a lot of the things that they were talking about were things that I was having real problems with. And so that doesn't even get close to comparing to rap and some of the junk that, that goes out nowadays. And so 
Garbage in, garbage out. You want to you wanna change what comes out of your mouth? You're going to have to change what's going into your heart. And you have to get a pure heart. And so that's something that obviously Jesus can do for you. Tongue's destructive in its influence. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. And again, you know, when, when, you, when you look at this stuff, man, there's a lot of this stuff that you see in church. Proud luck. You know, I've watched some preachers on Christian TV that I'm like, ooh, really? You know, there have been, there have been times when I've watched myself on Christian TV and I'm like, oh, I don't like the way I look. You know, and I, I'm examining myself all the time. And it's not that I'm, I'm trying to look proud or, you know, I got this little thing where I shake my head. It makes me mad when I watch it. It's like, what is that? You know, and I don't even know where it's coming from. It's, a, it's that kind of thing. So I try, to, I try to control those things because even though it's not what's, what's necessarily in my heart, it's still, I don't like it. I don't like what it looks like. And that's the whole idea behind a proud look. When I was a kid in high school, um, uh, I, was a, I was a jock. And one of the things that is supposed to have, be happening with jocks is you're, you're supposed to be all muscle bound and you're supposed to be all studly and stuff. And, you know, I would never turn my head when somebody called me I'd have my letterman's jacket on sitting out in the quad talking to my friends and we're all you know, ah, yeah, yeah. so he'd go wintery and I'd go did not turn my neck that's what I think of when I think of a proud look just this kind of, this kind of I'm a stud and you should know it kind of attitude <laughs> and you're not and I don't want to know <laughs> a lying tongue obviously Somebody tells lies. God, God really does not like, like lies. He, he, he mentions it a number of times in this passage. A false witness who speaks lies, one who sows discord among brethren, a lying tongue. God does not like liars, and so don't be a liar. You know, when, when people are lying, what they're trying to do is they're either trying to cover something up so that they look good, or they're coming up with a story so that they look good, or they're trying to um, keep from having to say something that they didn't do or say something that's true to somebody that they're dealing with so that they look good. The whole lying thing is usually just about that and, and that alone, just looking good. So maybe what we should do is stop worrying about looking good and start worrying about um, having an honest mouth and telling the truth to people. And you can tell the truth in love. You know, there's things that you don't need to be saying to somebody just because you think them. Obviously, having some kind of social skills and, and being kind to people is something that you need to be paying attention to. But we're not to have lying tongues. When somebody comes up and asks you something, they should be able to say, so-and-so said so, and so I believe him. I believe her because I know them, and I know they don't lie. And, uh, you know, don't make excuses for lies. You, you just don't do that. I've had people who say, well, everybody lies, and so it's not, you know, it, it, I don't know. You know, everybody has lied. You know, in my house, the, the whole lying thing, I just hate this stuff, the, the lying stuff specifically. And it's probably just because of where I came from. I got lied to all the time growing up. I got promises made, and they were just nothing but baloney. I had people trying to... Uh, impress me and people trying to get on my good side and usually it was it, you know it had something to do with junk that was going on in my family and it's just lie after lie after lie after lie and I became a Christian and all of a sudden some you know people are telling me the truth that's one of the things that got me saved guy standing up front doesn't care what I think telling me the absolute truth it's the reason I got saved and from that point on I you know I've, I've always been kind of idealistic and I think that when, you know, people are talking to me, my, my first blush is that these people are telling me the truth because they know Jesus and they follow him. And it's, uh, and I'm not stupid, you know. Jesus said to be harmless as doves but wise as serpents. And so I'm not stupid and I understand that a lot of people just say things just to say them. But first blush, I give people a break on stuff. It's always a bummer when I find out that somebody's, 
a ripping liar. I don't like it. I don't like it in my family. It's a, the, that is the thing. You know, uh, my wife could tell you that the stuff that my kids have got in the most trouble for in the time that they've been growing up is that right there, a lying tongue. You do not lie to me. You do not lie to your mother. You don't lie to other people. You do not lie. And so don't do it. God doesn't like it. Hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, many of us don't have a problem with that. Maybe some of you have. A heart that devises wicked plans. You know, the, um, the whole... We don't, we don't have people who are going out and devising wicked plans in the sense of necessarily being a terrorist or, or that kind of stuff. But I have met more manipulative people in the church than just about anywhere that I've ever been. People who will use, use Jesus' name to try to get stuff off of you. People who will uh, come up to you and just kind of insinuate that God has spoken to them about your situation so that they can mo get you to move in a certain direction. Wicked plans, trying to get something off of somebody else. And again, we're not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be people who are honest and above board. There are times when I don't want to talk to people because they're asking me things that I have, uh, you know, I, I have... Uh, you know, I kind of can't separate myself from. Whenever somebody comes up to me, for example, and says, Steve, what do you, you know, uh, I had a couple come up to me not too long ago and say, we got a big chunk of money because of an inheritance and, and that kind of stuff. What do you think that we should do with it? You know, should, should I, you know, should we tie that to the church? Should we do this with it? Should we do that with it? And they're coming up and asking me this stuff. And I'm like, why are you asking me? I'm the pastor, you know? And if I, if I tell you what I do, then what it's going to sound like is that I'm trying to get your money. I, you know, I don't care about your money, you know? And I didn't say that exactly to them, but um, I, got that, I got that concept across. And then they, you know, still asked me what I thought. And, um, you know, I, I just don't want to be in the position where I'm manipulating people into doing anything, including doing the right thing. You don't manipulate people into doing the right thing. One of the things that I tell everybody who does counseling around here is that all we are accountable to do is tell people the truth and then pray for them. You tell them the truth and then you pray for them. You don't, you don't, you don't try to motivate them in sneaky ways to do the right thing. You don't do that. You just tell them the truth. And then you pray that God works in them. So, plans. Feet that are swift and running to evil. Yeah, you know, have you ever noticed how, um, how quickly junk can get around? How, how quickly lies can get around and how slowly the truth spreads? Those are feet that are swift and running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And that's in the, in the context of um, you're called upon to uh, talk about a situation. In, in this case, it's, it's speaking um, about uh, problems between two people, and you are called upon to uh, speak about that whole thing in the context of being somebody who knows what's going on, and you don't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because if you're not telling the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you're a liar. You're hiding something. And what, again, you're trying to do is manipulate the situation. And that's in the context of court. It's also in the context of friends, too. So we need to keep that in mind. And then one who sows discord among brethren. Uh, people who like to go in and stir up drama. You ever been around people like that? And so you'll say something. This just happened to my daughter. I can't remember what, 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 what was said, but she was at work. And, uh, oh, um, a girl had brought in some tomatoes. My daughter hates tomatoes right absolutely hates them and so the girl had brought in tomatoes from her garden and uh one of the one of the other girls came comes up to her and she goes you know so and so brought this from her garden and these are tomatoes and bethany goes i don't like tomatoes and she goes well these are homegrown tomatoes maybe you'll like them and so she ate one and she's like "Ooh, disgusting you know i still don't like tomatoes even homegrown tomatoes and you know the girl goes back to the original girl who brought the tomatoes in and said Bethany says that your tomatoes are disgusting. Is that the truth? No. That wasn't the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That was a flat-out lie, and that was designed to bring about drama. That's somebody who sows discord 
among brethren because if it was the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, she would have said, well, Bethany told me that she hates tomatoes and that her mind was not changed by the fact that yours were sweet and wonderful and homegrown. That would be the absolute truth, wouldn't it? And so, again, you have that. And again, you're not supposed to be somebody who's like that, going around sowing discord among brethren. Um, here's another one. An evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. And have you ever noticed how, how um, gossip can just be this juicy stuff? Somebody's name comes up and you're just like, oh, yeah, what happened next? What happened now? And you get all into it. Well, there you are. An evildoer gives heed to false lips and a liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. So stop that. <laughs> Here's another one. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it and a flattering mouth works ruin. So if you're lying about somebody, the reason that you're lying about them is because you hate them, is what God says. And I, I just love the way that God puts things, you know, lays things down because he doesn't give you any outs. I, I really had, you know, some good motives about lying about the whole thing. <laughs> and really, you know, all you cared about was yourself and you could care less about the person that you were lying to. That's what God says. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. And that is absolutely true. Guard your mouth and tongue. There's a Swedish proverb that goes, it's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and dispel all doubt. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of times when saying nothing is the best policy. Just keep your mouth shut and bad things won't happen to you. Down in verse 9, it says, With it we bless our God, and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, Brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And again, one of the things that you have with Christians is that they come into a worship session, they sing songs that are designed to be glorifying to God, and they bless God with their tongues, but in the, in the very same building, they can turn around and trash somebody behind their back. And James is talking about the fact that that's not supposed to be the way that it goes. When you go to a spring, it's either bitter or it's sweet. It's either got good water or it's, it's water that you don't want to drink. And it shouldn't be two of the, you know, two different types of water coming out of the same mouth. And so obviously what we want is we want sweet water coming out of our mouth. And we want fruit that um, is appropriate to who we are. You know, it says in the passage, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? The snow spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. If I have the God of the universe living inside of my life, then what should come out of my mouth are things that are glorifying to the God of the universe. If the things that are coming out of my mouth are not glorifying to the God of the universe, the reason is because that's coming straight from my flesh, and you don't sit there and, you put, you know, and, and try to clean it up and try to pretend like it's okay or trying to try to rationalize it. You know, um, I've been in prayer meetings where... Um, people were doing prayer requests and they weren't prayer requests. They were gossip sessions where they said, did you hear about so-and-so? He's having this problem with his wife and thus and such is going on and that, and that kind of stuff. And then you find out later you know, that, that none of that's true and somebody's just making things up. Or even if it is true, that's not something that you share at a prayer meeting where you give people's names and stuff. There have actually been times when we've been doing sharing and wives, have been, wives or husbands have been saying too much about their spouses and I've stopped them from doing it because if their spouse ever walks in these doors and finds out that they shared the private stuff that they were talking about in front of a bunch of Christians, it's just going to wreck things with them. You watch your tongue, man. You watch what you say about people. There was no one who was better at insults than Winston Churchill, who had no love affair with Lady Astor. Actually, the feeling was mutual. On one occasion, she found the great statesman rather obviously inebriated in a hotel elevator. With cutting disgust, she snipped, Sir Winston, you are drunk, to which he replied, Milady, you are ugly. Tomorrow, I will be sober. 
On another occasion, Winston Churchill and Lady Astor engaged in verbal sparring when she told him, if I were your wife, I'd put arsenic in your tea. And he responded, if I were your husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> Washington Irving said this, the tongue is the only tool that grows sharper with constant use. The tongue is the only tool that grows sharper with constant, with constant use. Do you have a sharp tongue? Yeah. And uh, if you do, it, it's something that you need to take before the Lord and ask him to fix, ladies. Ladies usually have sharper tongues than men. They're usually able to use their tongues better than men do. If there's, if there's, a, if there's a chop war, if there's, a, if there's an insult war usually between men and women, Winston Churchill, you know, is not an example. But if there's a, if there's a cut them down war in between a man and a woman, I have, seen, I have seen men just ripped to shreds by women because their tongues are so sharp. They're good at communicating. And they're good at innuendo. And they're good at subtlety. And they're good at all kinds of things. And you need to take that and move from the dark side to the light, you know, and use it for the Lord, you know. There's a, there's a song I, I learned when I was a kid. Um, uh, it, it was by Daniel Amos, and uh, it was talking about problems in people's lives. And uh, the, the lyric goes like this. Sister Sue had a problem too, though not like Ben, she kept her cool, but when it came to gossip, man, that gal could rap. She found it hard to say something kind, wound up hurting someone every time with a juicy story she just couldn't shut her trap. Well, Sue found the secret of taking God's rest, and instead of making promises and doing her best, she let the Lord take her tongue in control. And instead of sowing distress and discord, she was so busy talking about the Lord that she didn't have time to talk about so-and-so. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a good illustration of where our lives are supposed to go. If my, if my heart is pure, and I'm walking with Jesus, and I'm going to be talking about the things that glorify Jesus. And if I'm not talking about the things that are glorifying Jesus... There's a real good um, chance that I am in the flesh. I am in the flesh. Blessing and cursing is not supposed to come from the same source. Mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse. And then um, in the last section here, it talks about heavenly wisdom. Let's just wrap it up. It, has, it says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. And right here, what James is doing is giving some insight to where some of this junk comes from. A lot of times that people are saying mean things or doing innuendo or telling half a story is because there's bitter envy in their heart. You know, for example, the whole story that I just told with my daughter. There's a problem between her and the other girl and what the, what, the, uh, uh, what the other girl at her work, what the other girl wanted, at her work wanted to do was uh, debase her in front of a mutual friend so that she looked better. There's an envy there. There's a self-seeking there. And that's why she did it. She doesn't know Jesus is, is the main problem, but that's why it was going on. And that stuff, again, is not supposed to have any kind of place in the church. It's not supposed to be here. You know, Jesus is the one who takes care of me. Jesus is the one who puts me in positions. Jesus is the one who gives me the ministry that he's called me to. Jesus is the one who puts me here. Jesus is the one who does everything with me. I don't need to care about what you're doing. I don't need to care about what you get to do and what I don't get to do. I don't need to care about that stuff. Promotion doesn't come from the north or from the west or, or excuse me, from the east. No, it's from the west or from the south. But God puts down one, one and he raises up another. That's out of Psalm 75. God's the one who promotes me. So I don't need to be envious of you. And uh, again, you know, I wasn't always in this position. I started off as a lowly usher at, at Calvary Chapel in Riverside. And there were guys who were getting to do stuff before I got to do it. And there were guys who, you know, who, who were letting me know that they got to do it. And I was feeling kind of bad about it. I shut my mouth and trusted God that he was going to take care of me. He's the one who promotes me. Same thing, thing in workplaces. If I, have to, if I have to trash somebody to get a promotion at work, I don't want the promotion. I don't want to have anything to do with it. 
And so again, you, you don't go there. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly and sensual and demonic. Check this out. See that word up there? That, that, that word at the beginning is Greek, and the first letter is a D. D, A, Ba, and that kind of crooked looking thing is an L. Diabolos is what that says. Diabolos. And it's a title for the devil, literally slanderer. Satanica, that's, that's that other Greek word that you see there, um, is a borrowing from the Aramaic. And at the end there, it gives you the um, definition, the principal supernatural evil being, the devil or Satan. Okay, check this out. See that word there? That first Greek word, diabolos at the top? Look at the next definition, diabolos. It's exactly the same word. And in this context, it literally means to slander. One who engages in slander, a slanderer. So when somebody is a slanderer in the New Testament, they are called a devil. They're exactly the same words. I like that, actually. I think, I think that if our word for gossip was the exact same word for devil in English, that lots fewer people would be gossiping, wouldn't they? If every, if every time you said, hey, don't be a gossip, you were actually saying, hey, don't be a devil, then there'd be a whole lot less of mouthing off around people behind their backs going on. And that's what he's talking about in this passage. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. And so if I'm ever in a position where I'm envious of somebody, and wherever I, when I'm trying to tear somebody down, or um, just kind, kind of trying to promote myself in a slight way while you know, letting people know a few of their faults and that kind of thing. I can know that that is something that is earthly. It's something that's sensual. It's something that's actually demonic. And I'm not to be doing it. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything, every evil thing are there. Have you ever grown up in a family like that? Everybody's just envious of, uh, of everybody else. Everybody's just looking out for their own selves and, and that kind of thing. You ever been around that kind of stuff? It's nothing but chaos. Nobody's together. Nobody loves each other. You know, they'll say they, they love each other and they'll give pre presents and, and that kind of stuff. But every, every bit of it is just nothing but a big fake because when it comes right down to it, all I care about, myself, uh, all I care about is myself and all you care about is yourself. And again, I'm kind of idealistic. But when I became a Christian, I thought it was different here. And what we're supposed to be doing is caring about other people and serving and, and blessing them instead of trying to get our own. It says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. And gentle is a word that, um, actually the, the, second, the next phrase there um, has to do uh, with the definition of gentle. It means willing to yield. Not, uh, you know, the wisdom that comes from above is not just stubborn, just for stubbornness sake. I had a, I had a friend of mine, uh, actually it's Gil. Gil and I would get in arguments all the time. And Gil was one of those guys that um, he just would not back down on something and it didn't matter what it was. He would, he would just make a statement about something and just would not change it. And I'd be like, Gil, that is not true. I'd pull out my textbooks and you know, all this stuff. It'd just be some you know, matter of fact. And I'd go, Gil, that's not true. That is not how it goes. This one time we were talking about atomic theory of all things. I'm sitting in the, in the, on the passenger side in the back seat of his uh, 72 Camaro as we're driving down the road. And he says something about atomic theory. And I'm like, Gil, that is not how it works. This is how it works. So I tell him how it works. And he goes, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not how it works. This is how it does. You know? And I'm just like, come on. And he's like, no, this is how it And I'm just like, okay, whatever. He goes to college. He's, he's going to college to become a doctor. And for some reason, he, had to, he has to take some class that had something, something to do with atomic theory. This is like eight years later. And he comes back to me and he goes, Steve, remember when we were having that argument in the car? And I go, yeah. He goes, you were right. I was wrong. And I was like, I, I almost fell over backwards. Gil Gonzalez has changed. You know? and it, was, it was that kind of thing. And, you know, willing to yield willing to go, well, you know what, that's what I think it is, but 
Maybe not. Maybe let me go check it out. But I'm pretty sure, you know, that, 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 that's, that that's how it is. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a Marvin Milk toast, but it does mean that if you're wrong, that you're willing to say that you're wrong. Full of mercy and good fruits. Are you merciful? Or are you somebody that wants your pound of flesh? When somebody does something wrong, you want everything that you can get out of them. And that kind of thing. They need to repent. They need to do it. Yeah, this is this way. You know. Um, if somebody's repentant, you need to do your best to make it simple for them to repent. And if they don't, then that's the way it goes. But you need to make it simple for them to repent. Does God make it simple for you to repent? Isn't that nice of him? I like that. I like it that, you know, I don't have to go around crawling on my knees for five miles to show how sorry I am for things. I, don't, I like it that I don't have to walk across, cut, you know, crushed glass to show my repentance and, and that kind of thing. I can just come before the Lord and go, Jesus, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. And call it the same thing that he calls it. It was sin. And I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And he immediately says, yes, that's merciful. And that's what you want to be with people who are around you. Good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, um, to wrap this up, is again that whole idea of you have different faces for different folks. So when you come and stand in front of me, you have one face. When you stand in front of the people at your work, you have another face. When you stand in front of people at home, you have another face. When you stand in front of people in church, you have another face. When you get in your car with your family, you have another face. That's hypocrisy. It's the idea of you're not the same all the time. And that is something that, again, is not supposed to be happening with us. Many times when I'm dealing with, with people that I'm having a hard time with in this whole area of the tongue, it is specifically because of the, the issue of hypocrisy. They will come in and say something in front of me, and then they'll go out in front of somebody else and say something absolutely different. And what do you do with that? What do you do with that? And so, again, it's just, it's just something that's junk and it's not supposed to be in the church. And so don't do that. Don't be like that. Be somebody, somebody that's just for real. And you know what? We're Christians. We love you. And we will accept you with all your faults. You don't have to pretend around here. Um, and pretending isn't going to work anyway with Jesus, obviously. And so if I pretend in front of, in, in front of Jesus' people, that's not fooling Jesus ever. It's not fooling him. And actually, you know what? It's probably not fooling the people that you're around either. You're probably not fooling them because we've all run into this stuff. So fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. And again, Lord, we thank you um, for the standard that you give to us. We thank you that there is a standard and that it's something that, that's different than what the world says. And Lord, as we go through, um, anytime I go through a study like this on, on the tongue, uh, there are always those things that are just going to be totally convicting and uh, where we look at ourselves and we just realize what we've been and what we've been like. And um, Lord, we all need your grace. We all need your forgiveness. Um, Lord, we just pray that as we come before you, that in, a, in those areas where we haven't been pleasing to you with the use of our tongue, whether it's just been with a sharp tongue, a bitter tongue, or even a gossiping tongue, um, Lord, that um, you would change our hearts like we talked about and that you would make us somebody that's new on the inside. We want the things that, that come out of our mouths to be things that glorify you. And so God, just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and uh, pray specifically that you would help us to be pure on the inside. And Lord, that whole thing with hypocrisy, we don't want to be people with a false face. Um, help us to be somebody, people who are walking in truth before our brothers and sisters, and also walking in truth before you. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. God bless you.